honesty and hardships of the Apostle Paul. What can we learn from them today? Let's talk about it with Philip Fleming on Steve Brown, etc. He's an old white guy, an author, broadcaster, and seminary professor who's sick of religion. And he's brought friends. Please welcome Steve Brown, etc. Hey, we're so glad you're here to give an hour of your time to us. It's a high and holy compliment. But then we deserve it. So <laughs> we appreciate your doing this for us. We have a great guest today. He talks funny, but he's got a lot of he's got a lot of good things to say and we're gonna talk about it. In case you're wondering, I'm Steve, the aforementioned old white guy. Matthew Porter is here. Matthew knows about hardship. Uh, he identifies with Paul. Like, like, well, the Girl Scouts selling their cookies right when he's trying to eat better. It's not <laughs> cool. <laughs> it's not cool. Our producer, oh, Jinx, temptation. is in the little glass booth. Jinx, you didn't bring any food today. I didn't even know I was supposed to be here yet. <laughs> <laughs> and our one-man IT department, John Myers, is in his tech bunker. When John fixes my computer, I don't think of it as John providing me with tech support. I think of it as me giving him a chance to grow in patience and kindness <laughs> and self-control. So, John, you're welcome. And Kathy White, well, Dr. George Beam is, of course, here. He's the president of Key Life. George's leadership philosophy is speak softly and carry a big cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and Kathy Wyatt is the soft feminine side of the program. Kathy, I don't know if you were planning to celebrate it, but today is National Pie Day, and I'm just saying. <laughs> There's still time. Uh, yeah. Before can, I, can I go home? <laughs> yes, yeah. if you bring a pie back, <laughs> okay. you can. Philip Pliming is dean of Durham, uh, overseeing the life and mission of that cathedral. Uh, he previously served as warden of Cranmer Hall, where he taught leadership in New Testament. And he has a great new book, um, I think we'll find out, but I think that this grew out of the soil of his dissertation. Uh, the name of the book, which I hold in my nicotine-stained hands, is Being Real, The Apostle Paul's Hardship Narratives and the Stories We Tell Today. I was telling Philip off the air that... Uh, Paul was, for a long time, not my favorite person. Now, I have a high view of Scripture, so I knew what he said was true uh, and, uh, and all, but he was kind of uptight, kind of angry, <laughs> kind of, and I thought, you know, when I get to heaven, I want to go fishing with Paul, with Peter, but not with Paul. I'm going to listen to his lectures, but I'm going to go somewhere else. And then I discovered a side of Paul that Philip talks about in this particular book. I found a childlike uh, side to him, a time when he cries, a time when he's so authentic and so honest, where he sins and says so. I mean, nobody who's a professional religionist should ever say the good I want to do, I can't do, and the evil I don't want to do, that's what I do. That's crazy. You can lose your job saying things like that. So we're going to talk about the Apostle Paul with a man who really knows. And uh, Philip, thank you so much for taking some time to be with us. It's great to be with you, Steve. Great to be with you, Matthew, George, Kathy, and Jinx. Um, greetings from Durham in the northeast of England. <laughs> awesome. And it feels like you're right next door. Technology <laughs> it's is incredible, isn't it? Ab yeah. yeah, really, it really. Does did this come out of the soil of your dissertation, or was I wrong about that? 
No, I think that's fair, Steve. It, it was a project that came about sort of 20 years ago. I was always fascinated, really. I, I became a Christian, uh, came to a living faith when I was 18. And I remember noticing fairly early on that there were there was this tendency to kind of co- always sort of talk about the the positive, just talk about the fantastic parts of the Christian life. And I, and, I, and I struggled a bit with anxiety in my second year at university. I'm thinking, well, where, where, where's there a place for anything struggles in the Christian life? How can we talk about this? And I came across these passages in Paul and I thought, this guy's being real. So I just tucked it away, you know, where you tuck away an idea and you think I'll come back to that later on. And then I, I did my theology training here in Durham and I was looking at an idea to research and I thought, that's what I've always wanted to do. I wanted to work out why did Paul tell people about how tough his life was? So I spent five years doing a PhD, which, as you know, Steve, is is always of technical. I did some empirical research, but I wanted to get it out there in a way that was actually going to be helpful to people. So that's what this book's about. Do you um, do you are you critical of those who talk about the power of positive thinking or is that I mean, is this all dark and painful and difficult and a subject for lament or do we get the other side, too? So one of the things I try and do in the book is 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 kind of uh, identify the way in which Paul is completely honest about the reality of his suffering. He takes no bones about it. It's his own kind of living out Good Friday. But at the same time, Paul says that as well as living in the middle of Good Friday, he's also living in the middle of Easter Sunday. So in other words, the only thing that gives him power to keep going in the middle of his Good Fridays is because he knows that God was raised, Jesus was raised from the dead by the Father. And so it's never just doom and gloom, but it's about reality infused with hope um, and how he sort of navigates that. So that's why he can say things like in 2 Corinthians 6, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, having nothing yet possessing everything. He's always living with the reality of suffering and the reality of hope. And uh, even despair. We despaired of life itself. That's a pretty yeah, heavy yeah. thing to say. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, that's, that's what, I think that's one of the most fascinating passages, Steve, which is 2 Corinthians 1, where he doesn't tell us, classic Paul, he doesn't tell us what it was that made him despair <laughs> of life, but he says, which gives the chance for commentators to speculate wildly. But he does say we despaired of life itself. But then he says... We receive the sentence of death so that we would rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. In other words, it was the fact that God raised Jesus from the dead that gave him hope in the middle. But I think that's probably the key thing that we need to understand is that Paul doesn't try and sort of protect his readers from the reality of what it means to live a Christian life, which is to live a life that involves hardship. You know, you do a lot of preaching at the cathedral, uh, and I'm sure these yeah. themes are a part of that. Are people surprised uh, that the Saint Paul should go through these kinds of things? And if they are, uh, does that say something pretty negative about the church? Yeah, I haven't been here at the cathedral long, Steve, but I was a vicar. I was a pastor for 11 years in a congregation. And I think sometimes some people have the assumption that if you're sort of a saint, life should be pretty easy. And I think when they come across these passages where they experience Paul being honest about his own hardship, they can either kind of just brush them away and pretend they didn't happen, Mm. or they can be a bit embarrassed by them. But actually, uh, I think that can be quite challenging to people because I think sometimes we live with an implied narrative, Steve, that basically says, you know, I used to have problems, then I became a Christian, and then everything was sorted. Hmm. And Paul challenges that because he says, I live with hardship and I live with resurrection hope at the same time. And if you come to Christ because you want all your problems sorted, Paul's Paul's stories create a bit of a counter-narrative to that. You know, this is and these stories, and you make this point, uh, need to be understood by us, but told by us too. Hmm. Because Hmm. we we walk the same road if we're honest i mean we deal with cancer with political problems economic difficulties all kinds of governmental stuff that paul lived with Mm -hmm. and probably the corinthian church where you center is the most like modern day culture you think yeah i think that's right there's huge amounts of crossover between corinthian culture which was successful 
um, competitive, high achieving, socially kind of concerned with status and the current and the present church, be it in Florida or California or Northeast England. Uh, and I think, therefore, looking at those comparisons between the first century and the 21st century means that we should pay a particular attention to what Paul says. I think you're right. Suffering in the first century was shaming. Suffering in the 21st century is often shaming as well. You talk about Christians, talk to Christians and they say, oh, I shouldn't be finding this difficult, but I am. Yeah. Well, Paul's got a message for that. Boy, he really does. Has a message for our present day. Uh, it's described by a lot of people as post-Christian. And I have a friend in Atlanta who wrote a book called uh, Minority Rules. And he said that we're in a different mindset, and it's not one that's that different from Corinthians. Uh, the Christians were in a minority, and we're fast becoming a minority, and maybe we're getting down to the muscle. Boy, we're going to pursue this, and we're going to find out so many good things, and if you miss a bit of it, you're absolutely out of your mind. The book is uh, Being Real. The Apostle Paul's hardship narratives and the stories we tell today. Don't go anywhere. Our guest is Philip Fleming. And uh, we're going to return just like Jesus. Philip Fleming uh, in his new book called Being Real, the Apostle Paul's Hardship Narratives and the Stories We Tell Today. Philip, early in the book, we, before the break, we were talking about Corinth and, and, and parallels between modern society and that, um, and that location. Early in the book, you, you know, talk about each city where, where Paul visited and how we kind of brush past the fact that they're all their own unique place, their own unique personality, their own unique contribution to his experiences and writings. Could you talk to us about, you know, kind of introduce us to those cities or tell us why that matters, how that factors into this? Yeah, thanks, Matthew. So that's really important. We kind of often do a broad brush approach, Matthew, when it comes to sort of the ancient world. We think, well, the ancient world were broadly much the same. They're all Greco-Roman cities, you know, much of a muchness, really. And of course, that's one sense that's true. But what we fail to understand is the diversity between those cities. Let me give an example, Matthew. So Athens, when Paul visited it, was effectively yesterday's city. Its heyday was 500 years before he arrived, you know, mm -hmm. and the classical <laughs> buildings were still there, but the power wasn't there, mm. you know, and they were looking back to the glory days. Corinth, on the other hand, it's only an hour down the road. You can get there. It's 50 miles. I traveled it in my hire car, took about an hour. It was almost like another world in the first century. Why? because it had been burnt to the ground in 146 BC. It had been re-established by Julius Caesar in 55 BC. Um, I think those dates are correct, the book right. Um, and, um, and he'd resettled it as a, a city along Roman lines. It was incredi incredibly strategically located. It had harbours facing east and west. It was had a north-south road. Do you know what I mean? All the trade came through there. And basically, it was absolutely buzzing in its first century heyday. So when Paul visited it in AD 51, AD 52, he was visiting it. I mean, there was still building going on, but the Lacayon Road, it would have been gleaming white marble. You know, all the shops would have been buzzing. Um, all the speakers wanted to come. And so you get this, I often describe kind of Corinth as kind of a Shanghai of its day. Everything glistened, you know, everything was kind of gleaming really. So Paul, and Paul spent 18 months there. So he got under the skin of what made Corinth tick, really. So what do you have in Corinth? You have, you have people who were quite economically wealthy, not universally, but there was, there was significant money around. You have people who were 
it was hugely socially mobile. So you had ex-slaves who'd become freedmen who'd now risen up to the top of the tree. Now, one of the things that means is, is that because they'd risen to the top of the tree, they were really scared about falling down again. <laughs> so they wanted to tell everyone how well they were doing. They couldn't put stuff on Facebook in those. They couldn't tweet <laughs> their latest holiday. But they, they built statues and they put monuments up about how wonderful they were. So it was socially mobile. It was competitive because it had something called the Isthmian Games, which were these big second only to the Olympics, which people kind of raced and competed in. Uh, and it had these really impressive speakers who would come, who would just really impress people. It was less about what they said and more about the way they said it. So you can get this sense. And this is what Paul got to know. He, he lived there. He, he walked the streets for 18 months and he knew how the Corinthians ticked. So yeah, Corinth was 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 a kind of remarkable, successful, competitive, but also quite anxious city. Mm. How interesting. Mm. Hmm. It was um, it, there was a lot of contingent there in the church itself too. I mean, yeah, I mean this what, was not your normal sweet church uh, where no, everything think, went fine. <laughs> But I think we often look down on the, the Corinthian church, Steve, as if they got it wrong. In fact, they were doing something that was entirely unprecedented because in Corinth, you had male and female, rich and poor, slave and free, Jew and Gentile. What you'd never had before was those people in the same place. Never. Mm. So, uh, And actually, Paul, Paul's planted a church where you actually brought people together in the same place. We read 1 Corinthians 11 and we think, oh, isn't it dreadful? They weren't in the same room as they met for Holy Communion. The miracle is that they were in the same house. That had never <laughs> happened before. Do you know what I mean? So, so, so I think the Corinthian church had problems, but in a sense, they were making it up on the hoof. So when a dog plays checkers, you don't criticize his game. You're just surprised <laughs> that he's playing at that's all. Right. Well, and, and, yeah, that's right. Uh, Philip, there were so many things that, that stood out to me in your book. I really have enjoyed it. Um, one sentence in the introduction, he's, um, uh, you say, uh, God is at work in the cross-shaped places and not just the places where everything is going well. And that seems to be a theme that you carry through, the, um, that the cross, uh, you know, not just an event, but it's actually a pattern for the way that Paul approached things. And, and it wasn't just uh, part of the content of what he was saying, but really part of the manner in which he um, you know, spoke to people. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, yeah that's right. Thanks, George. I, th I, th I think there's this really crucial distinction. If you ask the Corinthian Christian, they'd say, oh, yeah, of course we believe in the cross. We believe Jesus died. But Paul's got something else to say to them. He's got to say to them, actually, the cross isn't just something that happened to Jesus. It's actually the way in which God works in the world. And he did a couple of examples. He said, do you remember how I came to preach to you? He said, it wasn't very impressive, was it? It was weak. It wasn't it was vulnerable. It, it wasn't using all the special words that other people used, he said. But God worked in that weak place because you came to faith. And then he gets them to look around the room and he says, look at all of you. Not all of you are very impressive. Not many of you are rich. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 1, 25 and onwards, he says. But God chose what is weak in the world to build the church. So in other words, he's saying the cross isn't just something that happened to Jesus. It's also somehow the pattern that way God works in the world. And that's what gives him the chance to say, you know, if God was at work on Golgotha, if God was at work when Jesus submitted to a Roman crucifixion, God might be in work in your tough places too. So he's almost saying, the way I sometimes say it is, the cross isn't something, something you look at. The cross is also something you look through. And what that does for Paul, it gives, like putting on a pair of glasses, it gives Paul permission to say, hang on, if I look at my own life through the cross, I don't need to be ashamed of my sufferings because actually I've met God in those places. I've known what it is to have God walking alongside me when I've been ridiculed or when I've been emotionally distressed or when I've been physically beaten. Uh, and, and therefore, those aren't places of shame. Those are actually the very places God's been at work. Hmm. And so uh, we have a friend, a late friend, Larry Crabb, who says those dark places Instead of running from them, we need to run to them and probe yeah. until it hurts so bad that only Jesus, who always shows, will show in your dark place too. You agree yeah, with that's exactly. You? Yeah, and that's right. That's right, Steve, because that's what gives Paul the chance to say, whenever I am weak, then I am strong. It's not, 
I'm strong because I'm very strong. It's because in those moments, he knows God's power and presence. When his own physical resources have left out, he knows that God is strengthening him to keep on going. Mm. Guys, this is so important. It really is, because we've gotten it wrong sometimes. I've gotten it wrong sometimes. I, mean, I, I sometimes have promoted the Christian church as a commercial. What you can get out of it, that's not what it's about. It's a dark place sometimes, but it's a dark place where Jesus meets his people. And to put it in a personal way, if you're going through a dark time right now, don't run from it. Identify with Paul, and then you'll have a story to tell, and God will use that story. The book is Being Real, The Apostle Paul's Hardship Narratives and the Stories We Tell Today. We're hanging out with Philip Fleming. Uh, you can check out the beautiful church where Philip serves at durhamcathedral.co.uk. And you can keep up with Philip on X, formerly Twitter, at uh, Philip Fleming. And, and uh, Philip is with one L and the Fleming, Fleming, P L Y M I N G. Like Plymouth. I'll get it. I'll get it right. <laughs> I'm working hard at this. <laughs> I think he should have take a Philip. I think you should have take a camera with you when we get done with this interview, so we can go to Even Song. Yeah. Just, okay. It's on Facebook. It's okay. live streamed on Facebook. You're all right. So all right. anyone okay. wants all right. to come and join us, all go right. to Durham Cathedral Facebook. You'll have a good time. I'll go. Um, Philip, in this culture that we where we live now that is so heavily directed by and consumed i think that's a good word by social media um it seems that the people who have the the greatest following or rewards or whatever are are people who put up a front um you know y- you don't have to look at stuff for very long to realize that so much of it is not true it's just not mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. how what can Paul teach us about being real in a culture that doesn't seem to really care about that? Yeah, that's right. That's really great, Kathy. I mean, I think Paul's got a Paul's got a great story to tell, and the reason why Kathy is because if we understand that even in his day, Paul was swimming against the tide. Yeah. Mm. So, so he, the Corinthians didn't want to hear the stories that he told. You can imagine putting their fingers in their ears going, la, 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 la. You know, they didn't want it. They wanted to hear stories of success. They wanted to hear stories of people coming to faith and miracles. Now, Paul had those stories, but he chose not to tell them. So let's understand that it wasn't easy for Paul. He was swimming against the tide. But I think the reason why he did that was, again, he wanted to point people to Jesus. And he believed that when he spoke about his own hardship and the way in which he met God in his own hardship, he was pointing to a God who was at work in Jesus, who was crucified and Jesus, who was raised from the dead. Uh, And so, in other words, what gave him confidence to swim against the tide was Jesus. Now, looking at us, you're right, Kathy, that I think we need to um, we, we got huge pressure in our society to think that we glorify God most of all by telling other people how wonderful our lives are. We mm. think that must be the best thing we can do. You know, the best thing, you know, you, you know, pretend like I'm representing God and I'm an ambassador and therefore I've just got to tell about the good stuff and either I ignore the bad stuff or I repress the bad stuff. But what we've got to do is get our head straight, first of all, before we start typing on our phones. Mm. And getting our head straight means we need to understand that God is at work in more places than we think. And, and we've got to move away from thinking that, you know, the devil is behind all the bad stuff and God's behind all the good stuff. It's just not like that. God, in his wisdom, lets bad things happen to good people so that he can be glorified in their lives. 
Uh, and therefore, we don't have to be shamed. And that word shame is a really significant word because, listen, it's a huge, big driver in our culture today. People think I can't possibly say. Let me give an example, Kathy. I, I was a theological college principal. OK, so I used to run a theological college. I was training vicars. I would had a really lousy summer. I was often tearful at home. I was struggling at work. And I thought I was actually feeling better when it came to September. But I thought, no, I'm not going to pretend that everything's OK. And I just stood up to the students, I had 100 students in the room, and I said, you just need to know this has been a really tough summer. It's OK now. I've had some good help. I've had some good support. I'm not telling you this to make me feel sorry for me, but I want you to recognise that I've met God in an unlikely place over this summer. It's been mm. challenging, but I've discovered more about the compassion and the kindness and the mercy of God in the last three months than I think I've ever known in my life. And so learning to tell those stories where we meet God in the midst of tough places is actually it points to Jesus. It doesn't point away from Jesus. It's another way of pointing to Jesus. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. You know, uh, there's a supernatural side of this, too. These stories are not just stories of our pain and God's faithfulness. There's a supernatural intervention when we speak these stories that really does change lives, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I think that's right. It, 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 I've discovered that, Steve, when I've shared some stories or when people have shared stories with me, there's a sense of intimacy that goes on that God really works in. And I think people people recognize, Kathy mentioned earlier, people recognize that much of social media is just fake. Yeah. And when people are crying out for authenticity. And when that happens, I think uh, God can really meet people. I've, I've shared something of my story in all sorts of places. And people have come up to me and said, you know, that was actually a time that God spoke to me. Not when, you know, I was impressive or did a good sermon or something like that. It's actually when you talk about your challenges. Mm. Yeah, well, that's mm. not exactly a great commercial. <laughs> <laughs> but I get it. <laughs> I mean, it's kind well, of because what... Because we what are we advertising? We're not advertising a, a just a resurrected Messiah. We're advertising a crucified and a resurrected Messiah. Unless we're able to talk about both, we're, we're not a very good ambassadors. Oh, you guys have got to get this book. This would be a great book for a small Bible study. Uh, and uh, the people in that study will come out different because of it. It's being real, the Apostle Paul's hardship narrative. What? <laughs> the Apostle Paul's hardship narratives, yeah, and the stories we tell today. Hey guys, uh, this is really hard work, and uh, we need to rest and have some cookies and maybe grab a nap, uh, but we are going to come back, and we fully expect that you will too. In fact, you're going to be tested on this material, so... Pay attention. And, and if you haven't heard, the print edition of Key Life magazine is now available. And if you don't like it, you can't complain because it's free. Uh, to claim your copy, just visit keylife.org slash free magazine. Philip, there's a author, speaker, I want to say it's Brene Brown, I'm not for sure, uh, talks about the contrast between speaking from scars versus speaking from a wound. Um, in, you know, it's self-explanatory, but obviously speaking for something that you've gotten over and it's in the past versus something you are actively sorting through and haven't figured it out at all. It feels mm -hmm. like Paul does both of those. Is that a fair assessment? That's a good, really good question, Matthew. I'm not sure it is. One of the things that's interesting about what Paul writes about, and we mentioned this earlier in terms of 2 Corinthians 1, is actually not very specific about things that he's experiencing in the present. Uh, and for example, even in when he says in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 1, we despair of life itself, he doesn't tell us why. Mm. The only, I th he tells quite a lot of his suffering stories in retrospect. So for example, the, the, the thorn in the flesh, 
he said that's all in the past the beatings in 2 Corinthians 11, that's all in the past. And even the stuff which is ongoing in 1 Corinthians 4, he says, you know, we are we are thirsty, we are hungry. He, he, he's doing it in a way that's relatively self-contained. I mean, I talk in the book about, um, I think Paul actually has a good sense of boundaries. Mm. I don't think mm. he's oversharing uh, mm. because I think to some extent he's processed. And I think partly through writing it in Bound Papyrus is part of that processing. But I, I, I think one of the risks of, 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 of what I've written, and I address this in the book, is thinking that, that we go to the other extreme and we share everything with everybody all the time, you know, and we think, oh, that's brilliant. I'm going to simply tell everyone how miserable I am at the moment and think that's somehow honouring to God. I don't think that's honouring to God at all because I think that the risks of um, manipulation are very significant here. So, for example, I gave you the story about how I spoke to my students. I thought that through really carefully. I talked with my senior colleagues. I'd given them a draft of what I was going to say. But then I said to them, look, is this appropriate? I don't want to be manipulating people. And, and they'd sort of, you know, they'd sort of check me out and I was accountable for them for how I did it. You know, I don't put this stuff on Twitter, Matthew. I don't sort of, you know, talk about, you know, because I don't know who's reading it. Yeah. Mm. So I think we need to be quite careful that, we don't have to feel that we have to share our story with everybody all the time. We have to think about how, if we are in positions of power or responsibility, we have to think about how power dynamics work within that. But that doesn't mean we go to the other extreme and therefore pretend that everything's all right, really. I talk about this thing, I think, in the book about some Christian leaders sort of want to take people into their backstages, you know, their private lives. And then they what they do is present a very polished... <laughs> version of their private lives you know yeah. it's always beautiful glass of wine on a or a sort of you know their son graduating from a top university or something like that and you're thinking if you can't be honest about the fact that your private life is pretty mixed don't tell it about it at all do you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah there's a whole phenomenon of like uh female twitter influencers and they're it's all like i'm a mess today y'all like really because you're you look really <laughs> it looked like a lot of work went into you looking kind of all waking up like this I'm like it's just stinks all of it it really gets to i mean it, it really you go yuck <laughs> you know it's not in your book and i'm moving outside of corinthian no i'm not it's there too uh what about authenticity reflected in a mean streak Mm. I mean, Paul. How do you mean? Well, he had a mean streak. I mean, there was a side of him that was in your face. And, uh, you know, some of the stuff in Galatians, I don't believe I would have said. I mean, <laughs> I'm not even sure he's saved. Uh, that, that's authentic, too, isn't it? Yes, I think that's right. And, and I think behaving... Letting yourself be honest about some of the challenges is important. I mean, I'm always nervous about suggesting I'm like Paul because I haven't got a uh, place in the scriptural <laughs> canon. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, right. Uh, so, uh, and I can't claim that sort of. Um, so, I think, uh, but I think there's something about Paul being honest in the way that he handled conflict that I think. Um, I remember talking to a church leader and they said, I said, what's it been like doing all the church planting? And he's, I was uh, chairing a conference and he said, oh, it's just been a lot of fun. Now, I knew because I talked to him, it hadn't been a whole lot of fun. It had been a whole <laughs> lot of pain. Yeah. And it had a whole lot of rows with people because that's what had to happen. You know what I mean? So, so, so just be honest about that, really, because otherwise you're just setting other people up to fail. Because I'm sitting there thinking, oh, crumbs, if I'm not finding ministry a whole lot of fun, I must be doing something wrong. Whereas, in fact, you know, so I used to try and think, OK, um, you know, I didn't sort of I wasn't trying to transfer my I wasn't getting the students to process all the stuff I need to process on my own. But on the, all the on the other hand, I wasn't just putting up a face and pretending everything was all right when it wasn't. Oh, that's mm. so good. Philip, you kind of um, uh, contrast, highlight the, the contrast between the way uh, and referring back to the, the different cities that he visited. Um, contrast the way he uh, spoke to those in Athens versus how he approached the people in Corinth. Can you kind of talk about that? It kind of gives a sense of sensitivity to the context, maybe. Yeah, I mean, this is why, going back to Steve's comment earlier about he doesn't want to go fishing with Paul, he'll go fishing with Peter. <laughs> I'd quite like to 
have a bit of time with Paul, simply because I think he was a remarkable person at understanding culture. So in that bit in Acts 17, George, that you're referring to, you know, he goes around, he looks around the Agora and he works out what makes them tick. And what he does is he engages with them on a cerebral philosophical level. Do you know what I mean? Mm. He gets what's going on under the skin. And I think there's something for us as, as those of us in Christian pastorates or, or Christian ministry, we've got to start with where people are. We've got to understand what make people tick. We've got to kind of uh, and understand that that's not going to be all good or all bad. It just is. Mm. But there'll be some good news of Jesus that speaks into that situation. So, you know, in Athens, it was, you don't know who this God is. Let me tell you about this God. In Corinth, it was, you're terrified of of sliding down the social ladder but you don't know you're already a saint in christ you know mm. and and so i think there's something i find hugely encouraging about paul is he honors the culture where mm. he is and he then works out from that place or, or from an understanding of that culture what does it mean to preach the good news of jesus mm. oh man that is so good Philip, I know that you're you're uh, pinched for time and you have a service coming right up, uh, but it's been so good. Are you working on something new, a new book? Well, I, hopefully, um, uh, uh, there's a. Th I'm going away next week for a bit of a writing retreat, Steve. So I'll, I'll I'll have some more news after then, really. But I've got a new, I've got a few ideas in the in the locker. Listen, let us know, because you're a fun guest. You do talk funny, but you have, <laughs> you, you're a fun guest. Hey, Philip, I know how busy your schedule is and that you'd spend this time with us. Thank you so much. God bless you, man. I just man. love being with you, Steve. Thank you ever so much. Every blessing on what you're doing. And uh, I'm off to pray now in Durham Cathedral. I'll say a prayer for you all. Thank, Thank you so Thank you, much. Philip. Thanks so much. So much. The name of the book is Being Real, the Apostle Paul's Hardship Narratives and Stories We Tell Today. Uh, this is an important book because it's different, because it goes right to the heart of the power of the church. It's not in how well we do it, but in the cross. As long as you point to that, you'll be okay. Don't go anywhere. We're coming back. the gospel you can make it so dark and so painful and so centered on the cross that people will say you know everybody has to believe in something i believe i'll have another beer uh but you can also make it so positive that people think you're crazy and that's what's so good about this book and about philip and our interview with him is the extreme balance of the resurrection and the cross being a part of what the Christian faith is about. Speaking of which, one of the truly great books of the Christian church I just finished fairly recently. <laughs> and if you believe any of this, you'll believe anything. Get yours now. Yeah, right. <laughs> but the title of it was Laughter and Lament. And as I worked on that book, I discovered some of the kinds of things that Philip has discovered and that you've discovered too. This is not a rose garden, but sometimes it smells like it. This is not a delightful time, but sometimes it is. But sometimes the pain is wrenching. Sometimes the sin is so deep you're ashamed. Sometimes you think I'm not even saved. And that's a part of all of it. And those are the places, as Philip says, where Jesus meets his people. And I liked what he said about the witness. You know, every time, and I've said this and got it from John De Bruyne, every time a pagan gets cancer, a Christian gets cancer. Because the world has got to see the difference. 
every time a pagan goes through a divorce, a Christian goes through a divorce because the world has got to see the difference. And so it's a profound book that Philip has written and one we need to take account of in our own lives. Sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not. And Jesus is over both. Okay, who's going to be here next uh, week? Thank you for asking. <laughs> next week, our friend Jordan Rayner is going to be with us. And get a load of this title of his new book, The Sacredness of Secular Work, Four Ways Your Job Matters for Eternity, Even When You're Not Sharing the Gospel. <laughs> <laughs> That's him. <laughs> That's Jordan Rayner. <laughs> Listen, if you sometimes feel guilty because you haven't led the office staff to Christ. Not yet. Are your customers? We're working on it. Here. Yeah, <laughs> we haven't done that here at I'm Key trying. Life yet. <laughs> but you're gonna love next week's program. Same time, same place, and I hope you'll join us. Between now and then, don't do anything we wouldn't, and that gives you a wide, wide berth. You know, it's interesting to hear him say it. Uh, keep I know, yeah. I know. It's like I thought we Trump was Trump. <laughs> Maybe they made fun of him. Yeah, yeah. he's just uh, the British version of it. Yeah. More sophisticated than they thought. <laughs>